Oh, hello. My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Whoa. Today is a very exciting day because I am kicking off what will be damn near a year long series called Project Poirot, in which I go back and reread, and in some cases, read for the first time every single book in the Poirot series from Agatha Christie. So if you don't know, I am a huge Agatha Christie nerd. I have read the majority of her books, and as I was going through the list getting ready for this, I realized like, damn girl, yeah, you've read most of these. And I recently decided that I kind of just wanna do like a big old reread of the books featuring her most popular detective, Hercule Poirot. As I mentioned in my Where to Start with Agatha Christie video, which I'll link somewhere, in the cards or in the description box. I mentioned that I actually prefer Poirot over Miss Marple for sure, and that in general he is definitely my favorite of her recurring detectives, though I do also enjoy a number of her standalone books. And depending on how you count what is a true, like, book in the series because there were a number of like short story collections some of which were new stories some of which are just sort of like rehashing previously published short stories it's kind of hard to tell but basically there's roughly 40 Poirot books and when I was thinking about getting my PhD one of my number one ideas about what I would want to do for that is to track sort of the reflection of uh, popular moral philosophy as reflected in Agatha Christie's books, specifically the Poirot ones, because her Poirot series spans from the 1920, like 1920 to I think 1975. So like a huge chunk of the 20th century. And because they're murder mysteries, there's a lot of explicit discussion about right, wrong, good, bad, moral, immoral, things like that. And I ultimately decided that I'm not going to get my PhD, but I still am just like really interested to do this and kind of read all of the Poirot novels with that lens of like, okay, how does her discussion of murder and what it means to commit murder, how does that change over time? And how is that kind of indicative of certain social mores and given periods of British history? So I've decided that I'm gonna do that with you guys. I'm gonna do a reread of all the Poirots. I say a reread, but actually a lot of this will also be a re-listen because I have a number of audiobooks of Agatha Christie. So I'm really excited. I think that this will take us pretty much through this time next year so yeah buckle up because we are going on a ride and I'm also excited because there's going to be a major motion picture release of the murder on the Orient Express which is the 10th book in the Hercule Poirot series um, right around the time that I'm actually gonna get to that one so I'm hoping that if you're thinking about seeing this movie you might like read along I'm hoping people will read along with me in general but specifically for that one I'm hoping some folks might read the murder on the Orient Express and we can we can talk about it and then I don't know see the movie or something so like I said, there's about 40 books, and of those 40-ish books, I've read all but five. So most of these are gonna be rereads, though there will be a couple of new reads along the way. So without further ado, let's get into the very first one, which is The Mysterious Affair at Styles by Agatha Christie, which is where we are introduced to Hercule Poirot, as well as one of his most famous sort of like recurring side characters, which is Captain Hastings. Again, if you've seen my Where to Start with Agatha Christie video, you may know that The Mysterious Affair of Styles is, in theory, my favorite Agatha Christie book, period. So I'll just tell you that I really love this particular book. I think that it captures the time period in a very interesting way, right? So it is set, it, it was released I believe in 1920, but it's set during World War One, and it kind of captures the sort of jitteriness of that time period in an interesting way, and it also is showing essentially like the premise of the book is that Captain Hastings has been fighting in the trenches and is on leave back in England and has an old friend who invites him to come stay in this house called Styles, which is occupied by his mother-in-law who is a widow, so his father has passed, his brother, a ward of his mother-in-law's, and a couple of other characters, including like a secretary and of course maids, all that stuff. So this is Hastings' friend's stepmother's house. That is the setting for this murder. So I will say I'm never gonna get like full-on spoiler here, so I think you can watch these 
and still enjoy the mystery but I will warn you like some uh, some details will come out in the discussion of these books because like they kind of have to um, but I'm never gonna I'm gonna try to never spoil the actual like who done it of it all. So even if you've not read this book yet, I think you can still keep watching. So when I was kind of looking at this book, like when I was rereading it for this, you know, probably like the 10th or 12th time, specifically what I was looking for was discussions of like moral good, bad, and also people's perception of morality. And a few interesting things came to light. First, I think it's very interesting that this book is is told from a woman's point of view and her experience of World War One and its kind of horrors. So like, I think it's pretty well known certain poets, certain novelists who were men who were actually fighting in the trenches. There's a lot of literature that is discussed kind of about their direct experience. Agatha Christie didn't fight in the trenches. But she was a nurse back on the home front and she actually got her license to like be a pharmacist-ish. I forget exactly what the deal is, but all of the discussion of poisons in this book come from her firsthand experience of, of being a World War I nurse. So I think it's really interesting because she she it's a very domestic book and it's very focused, I think, on female power in a lot of ways, or like the power that women had during this interstitial, or during, uh, sorry, during the World War I crisis, because the men were all off fighting and the women were kind of like having to take care of shit at home. So it's interesting to think about the men who are, are present in the story. They all are either unqualified to fight, or they're ends up being something almost like kind of questionable about them because why are they sticking around the home front instead of being out fighting, right? So like, I don't think that this is like explicitly addressed, but it was interesting thinking about that this time in my reread of like, huh, it's interesting that this person is not fighting and they're not like, for instance, Hastings, who's there on leave, but he has been fighting. So that was one interesting element of sort of like the the potential just implicit moral questionableness both of all of the women because they are acting in some ways in a non-traditional feminine way because they are you know running you know the towns and they're running charities they're running these hospitals they're very assertive and i think at times that's shown in sort of like a questionable light or or the men don't always know how to respond to that but then also just the men are the men essentially inherently sort of morally questionable people because they're not off fighting. There's also a lot of xenophobia in this book, which is a recurring theme in Agatha Christie's work, which she really brings out because her detective is Belgian. So this is where we meet Hercule Poirot, and essentially the setup is that he is a refugee from Belgium who the ultimate victim of this crime, which is the host's stepmother who owns the house, she is the one who has facilitated him coming to England. And there's, there's a lot of sort of just like passing references to how you can't trust foreigners and all that kind of stuff, which is a sort of a recurring theme in English literature in general because of a number of reasons, chief among them being, you know, they're sort of historically off on their own little island. If somebody who is not supposed to be there is there, there's always sort of a question of like, dude, what are you doing here? You had to get in a boat to get to us. And I think there's just sort of like a lot of lingering kind of xenophobic perceptions and in, in British popular culture as a result of that, and that then got kind of imported into American culture as well. So really just like the existence of Poirot in any of these stories is always gonna bring up some some discussion of xenophobia or some kind of like prejudice against foreigners. So that's something that we'll be kind of keeping our eye on throughout this reread. But that was certainly present here. And it's not just Poirot, there's also a, I believe he's a German doctor. And if you'll, like remember that, remember that he's sort of like a Germanic-ish doctor because they are often kind of questionable figures in Agatha Christie. Like I can think of another one in Death on the Nile where there's sort of an implication that because they're German or because they're Germanic, are they legit? And then the other kind of like interesting recurring theme through this is a perception of someone's goodness. So there's an explicit conversation before the murder even happens in this book as to whether or not if somebody was a murderer, you would be able to immediately know if they were a murderer. And I don't want to get into too much detail because I think it would give too much of the plot away, but I, I do think after you've read the whole book, it's interesting to go back and see kind of 
how that conversation plays out. And Hastings is the one who is the kind of interlocutor in that in that discussion. So it's interesting to see how Hastings is always very confident, and this is a theme throughout the series, that he can tell if somebody is good or bad. He can tell if something is right or wrong. And he has consistently proven over and over again to be wrong about that, right? So he's very much the Watson to Sherlock, to, uh, to Poirot's Holmes. But I would argue actually Watson is a much more competent Watson than Hastings is. Hastings basically exists to kind of represent common middle class like salt of the earth morality and it's very interesting because Agatha Christie consistently puts his judgment and his assessment of things into question so that kind of raises a question of how she feels about sort of typical perception of like bourgeois morality or sensibility oh and then one other thing I wanted to bring up because since it's a these are murder mysteries I think adultery and financial difficulties are sort of the two like some of the two most recurring kind of sins that are going to come up in her work because they're often a motive for murder right so it was interesting to me specifically in this book to think about how adultery is handled so again I don't want to give away too many details because it gets into some of the nuance of the plot but it's interesting to me what a laissez-faire attitude Agatha Christie has seemingly in most of her books about adultery like in and I think it's for different reasons over time in this book I think that adultery is kind of perceived as almost like the droit de seigneur kind of thing of like the upper crusty men can do what they want right so like this gets into like the whole rape culture around like maids in in these large households and, and in the in the Americas that gets more into like slavery things like that but the sort of historical reality that men who were wealthy and you know privileged basically could get away with having either mistresses or just like people that they were raping in their households basically and that that was not necessarily seen as problematic for the man in question right like that was always placed on the woman so it's interesting because when that comes up in this book the ultimate sort of like committers of adultery are not judged as harshly as I guess you might think like kind of superficially you tend to think oh well back in the day everybody was like very you know uptight about sex like we kind of have this certain idea about what Victorian ideas about sex involved but they're not a very nuanced picture and I think this is a great example where I think adultery was much more sort of like understood or just accepted in upper crust societies especially for men now what makes and all this to say I think what's interesting is that Agatha Christie does not have like a very harsh judgment on women who are potentially engaging in this type of activity in this particular book. I think that's really interesting because if you're looking at sort of like traditional ideas about like the angel in the house which is a very 19th century idea in kind of English middle class there's this idea that women are very sexually pure and that that's a huge part of like their value in society and I don't think that that's really what she's getting at in this book so it's just interesting because that's much more typical of the aristocracy's attitude towards adultery in the 19th century so essentially if you were secure enough socially like you you come from like a landed family you come from like a titled family whatever like they are much more open about kind of being licentious during the 19th century than the middle class who in some ways are trying to buy their respectability through a certain kind of moral code and that's not what we see in this book and Agatha Christie to my memory doesn't come from the aristocracy she comes from sort of like the equivalent of like upper middle class or I don't I don't understand all the nuances of British class system I'm not gonna pretend that I do she I don't perceive her as being a part of the aristocracy so it was just interesting to me that she didn't have a certain amount of condemnation for the women in these scenarios because if you're looking at just sort of like stereotypes you might think that she would so anyway that was a lot about sort of the morality lens of looking at this book which I thought was a really interesting entry like entry point because it is so set in World War one and I'm always going to bring up some of the gender stuff in this series because I also find that very fascinating sort of the development of gender roles but it's interesting it was a reminder to me that the discussion that we in America have about okay men all went off to war in World War II women got used to like working and being a little bit more assertive and then when they came back women got kicked out of their kind of 
progress and had to go back into the their homes and then that sort of foments into unrest in the 60s and all that kind of stuff that discussion is much more applicable in the british context for world war one so if you look and and particularly because there was this sense that while the men were gone the women got a lot of freedom and experienced world war one I, I mean aside from like the grief of losing loved ones i'm not discounting that but like kind of if you look at it holistically there's a lot of arguments that have been made that world war one was in some ways a uh, step up for women in british society whereas for men the just sort of like blunt horror of the trenches created a huge amount of PTSD basically when the men came back and given and then also you know with like the economic struggles and all of that it created sort of a a real imbalance between men and women in the kind of interstitial period because the women could not relate to sort of the horror of what the men had experienced in the battlefields and the men had like lingering resentment because the women essentially had experienced what was a terrible time for them as freedom. So it, it's just interesting also to think that Agatha Christie is writing this shortly after the war has ended and that some of those dynamics haven't fully come into play. So I was just thinking about that as well as I was reading it. A little bit of nerd. There's a lot of history nerddom I'm realizing in this particular episode of, you know, Project Poirot. But anyway, aside from any of that, when I'm looking back, back at this novel as just like a book, as a enjoyable, you know, mystery, whatever, I think it really holds up. There's a reason why I've always said this is my favorite and it's because I think this book does a really nice job of balancing sort of like the puzzle piece Piece aspects of a mystery right so like you're getting a lot of clues and you're trying to put all these different timelines together and figure out who's lying and who's telling you the truth there's a lot of that happening but against the background of I think a lot of interesting kind of ideas about as I've been discussing World War One, gender dynamics, general character dynamics and I think what the mysterious affair at Styles really represents more than anything is both a turning point in the sense of like it's kicking off Agatha Christie who will become such a dominant figure in English literature for the next 50 years right so like this is sort of the dawning of a new moment in British society from a from a popular literature perspective but it's also an interesting turning point just because it's after World War One, which was like such a seminal moment particularly for France Britain Germany you know, Europe. Yeah, I just think that it's, it holds up to me because it balances those, those kind of like the micro enjoyable elements of the mystery with what, it, where I see it in terms of like social history, basically. So anyway, that's, that was long. I'm interested to see how I edit this because I've been talking for like 30 minutes. But that's my first entry in my Project Poirot series. So I think I'm going to start releasing these every Saturday for like, the next year basically so if you're interested in reading along I highly encourage you to do that I think Agatha Christie is just like good fun and what I love is that she's good fun but also you can do I think some of this analysis and and get into some of the nitty-gritty details here so that's what I'm gonna do because I'm a book geek I'm a history geek I'm all the geeks that's that's me so if you've read the mysterious affair at styles before please let me know what you thought of it like I said it's it's my favorite Agatha Christie book going into this project we'll see how we'll see how things shake out by the by the end of it but uh anyway i think that that does it so if you enjoyed this video please like subscribe follow me on the social means if you are so inclined and i think that that will do it i hope you guys are having a fantastic day bye